A very good morning, very good evening or afternoon, uh, everyone. I trust you can hear me okay. Um, firstly, a big, big warm welcome to this IOSH webinar, uh, gently, webinar gently, uh, uh, jointly organised by the IOSH Offshore Group and the East Anglia Group. Uh, branch apologies I do trust you are all well in these in these difficult and troubled uh, times uh, human factors um, the way we act the way we behave is hopefully of great interest to everybody and and I think it's fair to say it is a developing and evolving subject and as much to learn uh, for, for safety professionals uh, as, as more and more evidence becomes available with all that in mind uh, it gives me great pleasure uh, and perhaps even I'm um, actually honoured in many ways to present Dr. Marcin Nuzarak, who uh, is a, an award-winning specialist in the field of uh, human factors. So without me rabbling on anymore, Marcin, uh, over to you. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, good morning and welcome. I'll share my screen now. Um, and all righty, and we'll start. So, um, my name is Marcin Azarek. Um, I'm human performance and culture leader working at Baker Hughes, and I also chair the um, human factors technical section at the Society of Petroleum Engineers. By background, I am a psychologist and uh, a qualified safety professional. Um, firstly, I would like to thank IOSH Offshore Group and East Anglia Branch for the invitation to talk about uh, human factors. I'd like to try to make this session as interactive as possible and offer you some food for thought and make it truly useful. So I would like to ask you to have a pen and paper in front of you. Based on the slides, I will ask you some simple questions to reflect on some topics and would like you to write down the answers. You may also write down the questions as we go, uh, as we go along. So let's start. We'll start with a story. Two operators were lifting a large and heavy turbine inside a workshop. Suddenly, the turbine dropped and hit the floor, causing significant damage to the equipment. Fortunately, no person was injured. An investigation was conducted and the why question was asked five times. The identified root cause was the operator's choice to use wrong tools for the lift. So there is nothing else left to do other than initiate consequence management to teach them a lesson. It's common sense, isn't it? They broke the rules and must face the consequences. That's all I had for you today. Thank you. Well, okay, maybe that's not the end of the story. Maybe there is more to it. When we look into the incident from the human factors point of view, things were not as simple. We found out that the operators depended on many other people to successfully complete the job. There was a manufacturing engineer responsible for designing how the product should be assembled and what lifting tools should be made available. This engineer did not have lifting expertise and preferred to rely on the operator's experience. In the result, the operators didn't have the tools they needed. But that's not the end of the story. There was an HSC manager who was responsible for selecting lifting training. She chose a generic off-the-shelf course, which did not cover more advanced techniques that operators needed for this lift. There was also a product engineer responsible for designing the new product and creating technical drawings, which should have, but didn't, information about the center of gravity, which you can imagine is very important in such big complex lifts. So the operators were doing their best given they didn't have tools, skills, and information that they needed. If we continue um, the, this questioning and inquiry, we could find that the competency management framework for engineers um, did not include lifting knowledge. So the engineers were not prepared to support lifting operations. 
we could see that the HSC manager didn't have the budget and skills to understand what specific training was needed and that the product engineer was using software that didn't allow to uh, indicate the center of gravity, which then could take us into the discussion uh, about the role of IT and software procurement requirements. This story we started with is also a first lesson about what a system is. No person in an organization works in a vacuum, but rather every person is part of a network of dependencies. And the system is something where there are many parts that interact together. And you are a part of such dependencies as well. It's not only operations or the front line. So think about the deliverables that you agreed with your line manager for this year. Now we'll use your, your notebooks. So please write down two people that can make or break your ability to deliver what you agreed. I'll give you a, a few moments to, to write it down. So probably you could even um, write down more than, more than two. Um, and that's the nature of, um, of a system. And to quote a well-known human performance expert, Dr. Lam Ramla, most attempts to change people's behavior are doomed to failure from the start because they proceed from the fundamentally flawed assumption that people perform in a vacuum. If you put a good performer against a bad system, the system will win every time. And we'll talk about those elements of the system that may set people up for failure or success throughout um, today. So let's summarize this story. What are some lessons here? First of all, the work is done under many constraints. Time may be the most obvious one that, that affects everyone. We have limited time. Availability of tools, personnel, um, and many other things. These are the constraints that, um, that we work under. And the constraints in place depend on many other people in the organization. And finally, constraints determine what choices people have. So please note the choices that people have. I often hear leaders in the industry saying, oh, and then they just made a choice to behave unsafely. Or they just chose to do that as if that choice is completely independent of their situation. So workers make choices or workers have choices. And this simple shift to seeing a choice as a result of um, a situation will have significant impact on our ability to learn and because of that, prevent future incidents. So we using the word human factors, but we also use that you've heard, I'm sure the term human performance. Let's highlight the difference between the two. So human performance is about what people do and how they do it. On the, on the slide here, you see a person collecting a chemical sample, uh, but it's not only about frontline. It's about you as well, it's about me. It's what you do and how you do is how people perform. Um, and then what people do is influenced by a range of different things. And we call those things human factors, error traps, performance shaping factors. There are a few other names floating around. And those can be simply categorized into four buckets. One will be physical, and that refers to the physical environment. So the design of the equipment, design of space uh, around accessibility, temperature, lighting, all those things that you can touch and measure. Um, then psychological, that will be your stress, fatigue, your perception, your span of attention, all the things that are happening inside your head then will be social. And it will be only a truism to say that we are influenced by our bosses, by our peers or team members alike. And finally, organizational. We'll touch on that on a, quite a few slides today, but those are the 
processes, policies, procedures, and other things that are managed at the organizational level, which set the context for the employees and really give choices that, uh, or create situations which limit the choices that people have. So for example, um, if workers need a spare part uh, to repair a piece of uh, machinery, and in order to do that, they need to, they should, get the original parts from the manufacturer. And in order to do that, they have to go through the procurement process. And that takes six months from initiating to the time that the parts arrive. They will have choices. Your machine is not working. Should we wait six months? Or should we do something different to make the machine working? Maybe while we are waiting for the parts. People have choices. So here, um, the other important point is that a human factors has also a second definition. The second definition refers to the discipline of science and practice that uh, originated during the Second World War. And we talk about human factors as a discipline later today uh, as well. But here for now, I would like to explore further uh, those factors that influence what people do. Uh, I'm using here different terms just to familiarize you with, with those. Um, performance shaping factors is a term used by the uh, HSU uh, regulator in the UK. Aero traps you may see used by some uh, companies uh, in the oil and gas industry. There are some others uh, as well, but we'll start with those. Look at the photo. You see an operator operating uh, a control panel. If I asked you, what may increase the chances of a mistake? here. Have a look. What you could possibly say, um, or, or, or what is perhaps first thing that people tend to notice, are the pipes um, on the way. Uh, pipes that restrict visibility and restrict movement, right? So uh, there is only so much that they can do with their hands in there, and they, if they wanted to read the labels, um, that, that will force them to try to find a right angle but also they cannot get closer uh, to the panel. You see that there are also the labeling is small uh, on, those, um, on those buttons. You see that the layout of uh, those buttons is perhaps not ideal. If you consider that around 8% of male population is colorblind, then if this person happened to have that um, um, medical condition, then they may not be able to differentiate between red and green buttons. Also, um, depending on the uh, distance, they may not be able to read the small uh, labels there. So you see that there are on the photo already a number of conditions and th there may be other things which are not visible on the photo. What about if the um, work instructions are out of date? What if they are very tired because they've been working four weeks straight? What if the radio to the control room is not working? What if lighting is poor? And so on and so on. You see how, how the, the combination of those conditions increases the likelihood of a person making potentially a mistake. It doesn't guarantee a mistake, but it increases the likelihood. The other important point that I want to highlight here is this. Imagine what if, what would happen if the pipes were so hot that it would be uncomfortable or impossible to put your hands through it. But here, the operator still needs to operate the panel. So what could they do in order to operate the panel without putting their hands through the pipes? Maybe they could find uh, some sort of extension rod, or maybe they could approach it from an angle. Uh, both of those solutions will have their implications. If you do it with an extension, you will lose precision in your hand because of the uh, f forces involved. If you, if you approach it from an angle, that may also limit your visibility. And there are some other aspects related to the uh, perception of depth that may um, uh, result in um, misperceiving the button that you want to press. And imagine that you, you are uh, walking through there and you see you're seeing a guy with a stick trying to uh, to, to press press a button there. That could well easily uh, result in um, uh, stop work and uh, and um, 
uh, and uh, perhaps tense discussion about what's going on and what are you doing here. You see how we changed one thing in that scenario and how behavior changed. And that leads us to an important conclusion that it's the context that drives behavior. Context drives behavior, context which is part of the system. So every time a task is performed, there is a possibility of error. That probability may be higher or lower, depending on those different conditions. And an error trap is any condition that makes it more likely for people to make mistakes. The list of potential error traps are extensive. Here, I just selected a few of those for you. So um, badly presented procedures, um, poorly designed equipment, unfamiliarity with the situation, um, unclear instructions, um, noise, heat, multitasking, and many others. These, by the way, come from research done in the nuclear industry. So, uh, so they're not like somebody just thought of them. They were tested empirically, and the probabilities of error were calculated mathematically. So this is science-based insight. You see here that the, the, the first one, the bullet point, is about badly presented procedures. And the other, another very popular root cause that I tend to see in the industry is a claim that something bad happened because people didn't follow the rules. And the question why people don't follow the rules is not new at all. Um, nuclear aviation industry have been studying this for decades, really. Um, and in oil and gas, 20 years ago, this, this is a paper from 2000, maybe even more, published in 2000. So older than 20 years, so that's not new as well. But uh, there was a, a study done on um, onshore process facilities uh, where uh, researchers um, interviewed over 400 uh, operators about why they, follow, they don't follow the rules. And you see here the results. And again, I won't go through all of them, but I would like to give you a range of those challenges. So um, being out of date, unworkable in practice, uh, too restrictive. If followed to the letter, you couldn't get the job on time. That is one of the highest scores there. Um, there is a, generally a better way of doing the job. So these are the how the procedure is written and what is inside the procedure. There is a separate category about document management. So it's difficult to know which is the right procedure or it's difficult to find the right procedure. Um, or you see uh, other things like uh, people prefer to rely on their own experience. Do you see that there are two buckets? It's either the what, the, how the procedure is written is problematic, or the management of documentation is somehow problematic. Um, and that includes, for example, how easy it is to access, how much time it takes you to find the procedure that you need. Do you need to print it out? Uh, how do you actually use it? I remember I was in... Um, uh, in Alaska and the operator was expected to use a paper based procedure, but it was like minus 20 Celsius degrees. It was just, you know, you couldn't in those bulky gloves, you couldn't uh, have those procedures in hand. But that's also not the end because now if we say, okay, so the procedure is unworkable in practice, why is that? How come an organization allowed the procedure that perhaps should you know, uh, um, in increase the likelihood of success and uh, reduce the risk related to the activity, how come it allowed for the procedure to be un uh, unworkable? And so here we may have a range of different um, answers. So we are now getting into the processes related to managing documents. So. Uh, do we monitor how the procedures are used and provide uh, and feedback from, um, from the operators? What about the software that is used to uh, store or uh, provide access to those procedures? Do workers know which procedures they should be using? So that takes you to the training component and competency aspect um, of it. Um, are they involved? Who is writing those procedures? Somebody in the office um, or are they written uh, by the people who do the job. You see, there are many different considerations and by no means this list is um, comprehensive. The other aspect that I would like to show to continue on the discussion is um, a uh, guidance published by the Energy Institute. That table comes directly from the document. And what you see here, it's a busy table, but let me explain. What you see here 
is that you've got two rows. So at the top row, these are examples of findings from an accident investigation. And at the bottom, you've got examples of recommendations which are related to those findings. The five levels represent the depth of the uh, investigation. The incident here in that uh, guidance document was the person uh, got injured while reaching in into the pipe cutting machine. And so let's have a look at some of the, let's go through those, this example. Um, so at level one, we see uh, operator is to blame for reaching into the machine while it was on. You've got injury and then at that level you've got disciplinary action or other, some uh, other type of punitive action. And you see the, the cross here indicates that this is not an acceptable result. At level two, you start getting into the, um, the, the why. So operator believed that if they leave the guard, the machine will stop. Okay, so that's better. So you know perhaps what was going on in their head. And so the recommended action is to retrain the operator on how to use the machine. But you see there is a, a cross there. So why, why this is still not acceptable? See, because you, don't have, you, you haven't yet answered why they believed that or why they expected the machine to behave in a certain way. And at level three, you learn that operator received the training uh, on how to use the machine, but the machine used in training was different. And that machine in training, indeed, when you lift the, the guard, the machine stopped, whereas the, the one on the, on the shop floor did not stop. And so that is now uh, coming to the, um, our first accepted example of, uh, of um, recommendation where the training should be provided on the machines which are used on the, on the job. And then if you look at level four and five, you will see now we are going into organizational factors. If you remember those buckets, organizational factors, organization influences. So at level four, we see that the machine wasn't tested before being put to use. And level five, the finding here, the machine was needed quickly and the procurement process did not require the machine to have a safety interlock. And now looking down, so the corrective actions amend the procedure to introducing equipment and amend the procurement procedure to include risk assessment and add the requirements um, related to safety of the machinery. So we see how we are shifting and moving from level one to seeing level two and three is why it made sense and in what way, why they believe that certain behavior um, uh, makes sense. And then level four and five, we see the organizational processes that gave rise to uh, that context that then affected the person choices and resulted in um, uh, doing what they believed made sense at the time. So we started our, uh, our discussion with a story and question about the choices. So in light of what we covered, let's think about how we think about why accidents happen, especially with regard to human behavior. We, there is a lot of uh, discussion that it's the unsafe acts that cause accidents, unsafe choices that uh, cause accidents uh, or unsafe behavior. So basically you've got this focus on the individual and them being a cause of a problem in the same way as a bad apple metaphor is used. You've got a basket of apples, one apple goes bad. And if you don't remove that apple from the basket, it will be a cause of other apples going bad. Therefore, your corrective action is to remove that apple. And that metaphor is often used in our industry. And so that is a very popular view that behavior, choice or non-compliance or error or those different labels, complacency, what have you, the different labels that focus on the behavior is a cause. And then your corrective action focuses on those individuals, um, either retraining or, um, or punitive, uh, punitive consequences, often also relying uh, on examples from the world of um, law uh, and, criminal, uh, and criminal law. So, um, Whereas the modern view, and by modern, I mean it's 30 to 40 years old. So it's, it's not like developed yesterday. Um, so in that modern view, um, it's, these are the constraints and error traps 
in place which determine that choices that people have. And it's the context, like you remember this photo with the person operating the panel, it's the context that drives behavior. And if that's the case, and you see here that I'm highlighting the on the left, that these are unspoken beliefs and assumptions. This is what uh, leaders, HSC professionals often have in mind, and they are unspoken, they're unarticulated, these are belief, I believe this is happens, and that belief is driving the corrective actions. But uh, here, if if you articulate those and you start with a different point of view, and if you see behavior as a result of something else, then your corrective actions will focus on those constraints. In the same way as in our, um, in my story about the lifting, it would be insufficient to just train those or retrain the workers in isolation. We uh, needed to address the challenge of uh, tools that they have, information that they needed, uh, and the skills that they needed in a systematic manner. And it's not only also about those two operators, it's about other operators that may face similar challenges. And one more important point here is that we don't have to wait for an accident to learn. We can learn about those constraints and uh, and error traps before, um, before they happen, and how to do it exactly, that may be um, a topic of another uh, webinar. So um, now I would like to move uh, and cover briefly human factors as a discipline. You may remember that uh, human factors has two definitions. One is those things that influence what people do, and the other one is the discipline. So as discipline, it's a borrowing insights from many different fields. So um, we've got engineering, married with psychology, giving rise to engineering uh, psychology, and that overlaps with, uh, with ergonomics. When you design control panels or touch screens for operating, you now have to combine psychology and engineering and IT and maybe statistics and maybe uh, some other things. When you design a plant or facility, you need to, um, you need to understand the human body and its strengths and uh, sizes and dimensions so that you design valves to be accessible at this uh, positioning so they're easy to access and the forces are optimal for human body and they are not positioned above your head because that would uh, put certain forces on your musculoskeletal body system uh, increasing the, um, the chances. So it is a broad discipline. It is a scientific discipline. So those developments are based on scientific studies. You can get educated from having a certificate, and I'll mention a certificate in a moment, to master's degrees, to doctorates, and you can do professorships. Um, there are professional bodies, like there is chartered engineering, uh, chartered Irish, there are chartered human factors, uh, professional bodies, and uh, both in the UK and internationally. It's not new. It started during the uh, Second World War um, um, in the military context initially. Um, and then was uh, transferred into the civil applications. And importantly, this is not something that you, that you improve by running a communications campaign. It's, you cannot do a poster or run a comms campaign and tell people about human factors and it's sorted. It, it will not work that way. And uh, maybe that's one of the challenges why we're struggling with the implementation is that there is a strong belief that you change things by raising awareness. No. Uh, human factors needs to be integrated into your existing processes. So we already talked about. So when you have investigation, the HF tools and techniques needs to be integrated into your process of investigations. If you're designing equipment, the HF principles and, and best practices and requirements and needs to be integrated into that design process and supported by the competency of engineers, etc. So uh, raising awareness has its place, but is insufficient to make progress. And in terms of the scope, this is a human factors is a discipline that covers many different topics. What you see here is what we call human performance wheel. You see human performance in the middle with a range of different topics on the um, outside. And I won't go through all of them, uh, but just to highlight a range. And those are based, this list is based on the guidance published by the Center for Chemical Process Safety. And you see that there is um, culture and leadership and shift work management and training. Um, and we've got incident investigations and risk assessment, hazard 
um, analysis. Behavioral safety is one of the topics. And then we've got engineering topics like labeling, alarm management, human machine interface, and many others. And so a couple important points here, that this is a diverse discipline and not owned by one function in the business. So some topics may be owned by engineering, like for example, design of control rooms. Others may be owned by safety, like risk assessment on investigations. Others yet may be owned by HR, like leadership development. For most of those topics, there will be decades of international research, which give rise to industry standards and development of tools and methods. I'll show you those, um, some of those, uh, in a moment, and I'll show you where to find them. Um, and then we've got the um, examples of best practices and evidence that um, uh, that if you apply those techniques, then you get better results. I remember seeing um, uh, attending a conference where a professor of uh, human machine interface design was showing two designs of a control panel that would be used on rigs. Uh, with different layouts of the buttons and different technologies for the uh, touch screen glass and etc. And he said, with this design, the um, we are getting 70% of mistakes. With that design, we are getting 10% of mistakes. So you see here, and they were able to quantify that and demonstrate empirically that design gave rise to mistakes. Now, what are now let's let's reflect or let me share what you can do. So um, if you would like to learn more, one of the challenges is that human factors is not very well integrated into engineering or safety education uh, globally. Um, when you do your Nibosh diploma in, in the UK, you will come across some human factors models, but you will not get a solid grounding in um, uh, in the um, in the discipline um, and so for for this reason we've developed a, a human factors competency framework um, this is available now to everyone through the chartered institute of ergonomics and human factors and energy institute and also uh, there is a new human performance oil and gas body that uh, we co-founded that is focused only on human performance i'll i'll get to that in a second um, so here um, it starts with the e-learn and uh, the e-learn takes two to three hours and it um, um, gives you an overview of a different topics um, in the human, um, human factors uh, world. And then um, there is level one. So level one now moves into practical application. So there are uh, nine topics from how to analyze where mistakes can happen, how to review procedures, for mistakes and error traps, uh, equipment design, workstation design, the best practices investigation at the simple level, um, theoretical comms, workload, stress, fatigue, culture supervision, alarm handling, and there is also a choice to, um, to uh, learn about the psychology of compliance with warning signs. So why people don't follow a warning signs that, that you may have displayed. And so that is ready, uh, available already for you. Uh, if you continue the, uh, your journey, uh, you can get to level three. You get specialized, so you cover fewer topics, but more in depth. And when you finish all three levels, you are um, uh, uh, eligible for the human factors, um, for the technical membership grade in the Chartered Institute of Human Factors. So, um, that's something that is already available. And let's compare that with the um, experts. So human factors, like engineering perhaps, like psychology, are technical disciplines. Perhaps you wouldn't, um, uh, we want to target, we want to have specialists because it is a specialist knowledge that takes time to develop. So what you would expect from uh, an HF, uh, HF expert, um, similar to engineering, you've got uh, a, a degree, um, or other qualification, practical experience, uh, evidence of professional development and professional certification or the membership in a professional uh, body, which typically require evidence of, um, of work. Um, and some examples of skills that would be expected from experts is to understand anthropometry, being measurement of the body, physiology, so the medical side or the, um, the um, 
how our body works, how the vision works, how your hearing works, how the muscles work, um, and psychology. So how your decision making works, your memory, uh, etc. Uh, things like cognitive task analysis to understand how people make decisions and to be able to elicit knowledge, workload analysis, human centered design, or user testing. The list of uh, those, um, the list of those experiences um, is long and are listed. Um, for example, by um, on the website of the um, CH, the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors, if you'd like to see. Um, and so this is the last slide um, that I would like to do. Um, the previous slide talked about what you can do as an individual. Here I would like to reflect with you uh, what an organization can do. Because even if you have passionate individuals who learn about it, that may not be enough. So this is a table which is based on the UK HSC guidance, again, not new at all, on assessing uh, organizational capability related to human factors. And what you see here in the middle, um, you see that a range, of, um, a range of considerations, a range of elements, and then you've got five levels. For the simplicity of this exercise, let's say that level one means I know nothing about it, we have nothing in place, to level five being we have a comprehensive solution in place which is well resourced and uh, is progressing. Okay, so, so just to th think about this very simple dichotomy, let's go simply through this. And again, if you can use your uh, pen and paper and just put the number um, to indicate which level you believe your organization is at uh, with this. I appreciate it's rudimentary, but uh, it's a starting point to think about what may be needed. So number one, do you have a policy and strategy outlining how you will uh, integrate human factors into your existing processes? And write down the number. It can be number one and whatever the number. Investment. Investment refers to the people's time, having experts or other type of uh, investment, whether monetary or non-monetary. Um, into that. So do you invest in HR? Then is training. Do you have a systematic training in place that uh, reaches different audiences? It's not only about the front line and it's not only about uh, safety professionals. We need procurement, HR, we need leaders at different levels. So do you have training in place that covers those? What about the availability of qualified staff? Do you have HF experts or access to HF experts? Number five, do you, uh, do you have integration of HF into your operational uh, plant? When you, for example, um, um, do, do you understand um, how to integrate HF into the planning uh, process in order to reduce the risk? Number six, do you understand which activities may result in severe or catastrophic consequences? how human failure can happen and what are the error traps that increase the likelihood of that failure. That is the risk uh, management related to human factors. Number seven, do you progress, uh, do you track your progress through KPIs or other, other form of targets? And finally, you've got the effectiveness, evaluating effectiveness of the HF activities. It only makes sense if this effort is adding value. If it's not adding value, then uh, when it needs to be rethought. So with this in mind, um, take that to your organization and uh, discuss uh, where you're at. And um, this, uh, HPOG uh, offers further guidance on how to implement it. HPOG.org, you will receive those links later, um, offers a guidance on uh, where to start, gives you tools, templates, uh, and guidance um, to, to help you to make those first steps, aiming to comprehensively integrate HF into your processes. And these are some additional resources. So um, have a look at the ELEN. Uh, it's two or three hours, but uh, have a look. It's modular, so you don't have to do it all in one time. Have a watch some videos and see what's interests you. There, there are over 15 different top HF topics uh, explored there. Uh, learn about HPOG and the content there. There is a guidance, for example, on how to um, review procedures um, to understand where mistakes can happen and how to integrate uh, HF into procedure management system. Um, join SPE. 
and I very much welcome and I invite you to join Human Factors Technical Section. Um, there is very uh, a lot of exciting stuff coming. Um, and there are other resources that we'll share. Uh, Energy Institute, IOGP, they're publishing uh, industry guidance uh, on many different HF topics. And, and there is more. So with this said, um, thank you very much for your attention. We've covered a lot of ground and now I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you very much, Marston. Um, now, the first question we, relates to one of your slides. So if you could leave your slides up just now, mm -hmm. we can perhaps refer to that one for you. Okay. Um, so the first question from John Payne, um, are the bullet point error traps in some sort of common rank order? So there was a slide earlier on. Earlier on, okay. So about on. the error traps. Okay, okay. Were they uh, were they ranked in order or was okay, it? Okay, okay. Um, Understood. No, they're not here, not on the slide. But uh, um, in, in those research uh, in the nuclear I mentioned, they are. And the um, unfamiliarity with a situation was a factor that had the highest impact on the likelihood of uh, of error. Uh, and you can see that um, in uh, publication of the heart method. So original heart method has those numbers uh, included there. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, the next question from Paul Daly, um, what kind of specific KPIs are generally used regarding human factors? Okay, so um, Energy Institute published a document, actually a guidance on uh, the KPIs related to, um, to human factors. And those KPIs firstly will be depending on the topics that you're progressing. Because if you look at the, um, at the wheel, there are many different topics and uh, you probably won't, um, won't focus on all of them. So we will prioritize. Uh, and then depending on what your activity is. So for example, if we take incident investigation, you may decide on a number of actions. So first one, you may decide it needs to start with upskilling people, investigators and the recipients. So then that would be your training, that would be one. Then you may decide that, oh, we need to integrate, we need to change the uh, procedure. So for example, set the requirement that human factors analysis needs to be part. So maybe tracking progress on that, especially corporate changing co corporate policies, uh, this is the effort. Um, next one, maybe um, you may track, for example, um, uh, your findings from investigation. So if you see uh, root causes such as error or non-compliance or complacency, it tells you that you are not there yet. Uh, and so looking into the ratio of error traps versus other deeper systemic causes, maybe another example and so on. But it does depend on what you agree uh, as you move forward and the uh, fairly comprehensive range of ideas uh, is available in that energy guidance, uh, an energy industry guidance document. Okay, thank you. Now we've got a couple more questions here. Um, let me just, so from Khalid, what part does fear play in human error? Operators are scared of getting things wrong or their competence being questions, questioned. Does that lead to human error? That's a great question. So, um, so fear is an emotion, uh, and I think it may result in a similar symptoms as heightened stress. And we we do know that stress, uh, heightened stress beyond your ability to cope, uh, affects your cognitive processes and your ability to think. And yes, it does increase the likelihood of error. Is also associated with the workload. So possibly, but I would also add that fear has other important implications. Fear uh, suppresses speak up. Uh, and if you've got a culture of fear that it's pretty much, I'm, I'm confident that you don't have people speaking up about what can be improved and about weak signals. And if you think about continuous improvement, you need to be on the top of weak signals. You want to know what can go wrong and you need to know that early. And where's the fear? You, you will not know or people will be uh, telling you what you want to hear, which leads to uh, an illusion of control. So fear actually has a broad ranging consequences for the organization and uh, uh, increased likelihood of error is just one. Okay, thank you. Now we have a couple more questions. So another one from Andrew Morris. Would the reasons why people don't follow procedures make a good sense checklist for testing procedures against? 
Um, so to, 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 yes, you could start with that, but there are possibly other tools that may be even more uh, helpful. So one of the tools is so-called walkthrough, talkthrough. So where you um, go through the procedure step by step and you discuss with the operator what makes it difficult, what may be confusing here, what do you need, what is setting you up potentially for failure, uh, and also helps you to identify which steps may be critical from the safety point of view or quality point of view. By critical, I mean if misperformed, uh, it may result in a severe injury or other severe, uh, severe outcome. Um, this is the review of the existing procedure. If you're starting from scratch, a task analysis type of technique would be even better where you work with the person doing the job to break the task into steps and sub-steps um, and, uh, and then design the procedure based, uh, based on that. And again, hpog.org uh, will uh, provide guidance on that. Uh, but this list may be a good starting point um, to, uh, to have a chat with your operators. Okay, thank you. Now we've got a question from Tim Ingram. Have you ever seen an informed leader making a significant difference? Refers to the point about a good performer in a poor system. So yes, where you've got a poor system and you've got an informed leader, have you seen that? Have you witnessed that making a significant difference? Okay, great. So great leader, poor, poor system. I've, yeah. seen, I've seen great leaders uh, who managed to maintain high level of engagement of employees despite the poor systems, but the poor system, as it remains in place, uh, still puts a pressure, still sets that context and still makes the work difficult. So for this reason, although yes, you can counter and balance uh, the impact of the system with good leadership, but the moment it changes or the moment it weakens, the system is um, entering again. And there will be some also aspects like design uh, that uh, the leadership will not do uh, much about. If you've got a panel that uh, is confusing uh, and makes people believe that you should press this while you should press something else, um, leadership and competency training will have very limited impact, even though people may remain engaged um, in uh, you know, in, into safety and, and discussion, etc. Okay, thank you. Now we've got an, another question here from Simon Rosser. How does carrying out routine tasks, but in a variety of environments, such as in construction, for example, a multitude of different sites on different days, affect human factors, when a main focus appears to be the regular use of specific plant in a single site? Mm. For example, nuclear, oil and gas plants, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's great. So you, you will have variability. And although the task may be the same, the contexts will be different because positioning is different, the resources are different, the communication is different, the layout is different, the tools are different or whatever else is different. You will have that vari um, uh, variability. And so that variability will be then uh, resulting in adaptations. So here, the context will drive behavior and that context from site to site will be driving behavior and the combination of factors at those sites uh, may be increasing the likelihood of something going wrong and that likelihood may be different per site because of that unique combination of factors there. So yes, although off, well, well, a lot of research in human factors that come, does come from nuclear, for example, when you've got you know, the same plant, uh, et cetera. Uh, but even then you will have variability uh, related to, um, to, to uh, things changing. And so here the question is to think about behavior as a form of adaptation to the variable context and getting people engaged, understanding um, what that variability is um, and to work together with different parties and, and stakeholders um, to uh, address the, uh, the factors that increase the likelihood of um, errors or undesired behaviors. Okay, thank you. Um, and have, have you got some examples of human factors to be thought of for operational planning? Is there a, a kind of must starting point, I suppose you would call it? Okay, so um, yeah, so the planning will start with the risk uh, assessment and with risk assessment, you would like to not only identify hazards, which are very important, but also understand error traps. So for example, if you've got visual similarity of objects, so two valves look exactly the same, 
uh, right? But uh, if you open the wrong one, you, you might have a big problem. Then visual similarity is typically not th thought of as a hazard because the visual similarity can cannot harm you as such, but it may confuse the actions of the operator. So this is an example where, where you would start. Then you've got the role of uh, supervisors. Then you've got also in planning um, the coordination aspects. So in my lifting example, I talked about dependencies. So um, do, do operators have everything they need to make it easy to do the right thing and difficult to do the wrong thing? Um, and so of course you would go into appropriate level of um, of detail there. So these are some examples. Okay, thank you. Um, so we've got one final question here um, from Dan Wilkins. Have you got, are there some books that you would recommend as a starting point in order to gain a basic understanding, build knowledge and close gaps with one's skill set? Uh, sure, yes. Uh, and so that would also depends on uh, where you are at your journey. Um, and your uh, preferred reading. So uh, if you want something short and simple uh, on those different topics, then I would start with the Energy Institute briefing notes. There are 24 of those, if I recall correctly. Uh, each one is about five pages long uh, with simple explanation, example, and a checklist uh, with a list of questions that you may ask straight away uh, to your operators. If you want a guidance on how to do something, there is IOGP, uh, documents uh, and Energy Institute as well. So um, IOGP published fantastic documents on human factors in investigations. Um, then you've got understanding error and this transition in thinking from thinking that the behavior is a cause to thinking that the behavior is a result. Uh, and here I would recommend the uh, Sidney Decker's book, The Field Guide to Investigating Human Error um, to, to start with. So um, that would be my recommendation. Okay, thank you. Um, we've got another, we've got a couple more questions coming in, so they're, they're still coming in thick and fast, which is good. Um, so we've got one from Sarah Prince. Um, Hi, Marcin. How would you encourage leaders to increase knowledge in human factors? Hi, Sarah. Um, so the encouragement so I would say that there, are, there would be two phases in my experience as I work with, with senior leaders. The first one is a hook. So a hook is something, a short snappy piece of information that is uh, engages the interest. Oh, wow, really? Is, is that what it is? Uh, and what, what helps here is, for example, um, the uh, showing that the error is not the cause, but it's a, an outcome, something simple that grabs their attention. And once that the attention is there, then we've got uh, capability building efforts. So that will may start with the eLearn I've mentioned. Um, this eLearn uh, has been completed by many senior and executive leaders with very positive feedback. Um, so that's that's one. Uh, and then uh, other uh, other uh, efforts to to go uh, more in depth. I've done it through the presentations, sharing uh, what I've read and found and uh, what I what I know or other uh, forms of training. But those two phases, hook to get their interest and then expand slowly, maybe topic by topic, depending on what is important. If investigations are at the top of your agenda, then uh, start, start with that and show them what's the difference between uh, investigation without HF and with HF. Thank you. Now we've got one final question from Saeed. Can you relate the basics that we learn during NIBOSH mistake error violations with the detailed models of human factors? Yes, so what you're referring to is a human error model developed by James Reason 30 years ago uh, or, or so. Um, so um, that uh, I would say uh, was very important development uh, over time, but there are also a number of challenges related to, uh, to that framework. Uh, language is one. So uh, thinking about psycholinguistic language uh, plays a role in, and affects your thinking. So if I say, oh, you violated the rule, then that has multiple meanings and implies also guilt and blame. And the problem is you as a person because you violated, you chose all those problems with choice I've discussed. Um, and, and so um, there are other ways to think and understand behavior, which may be 
more effective uh, in my experience that I found and also avoid uh, that language that in some cases also came from criminal law, if you read James Reason. Um, and, and so um, thinking about what makes the work difficult and um, uh, and yeah, uh, there will be there will be other um, other models that look into the system more comprehensively than this particular model. Perfect. Thank, Thank you, you very much, Rated, for, for asking all the questions because they they did come in uh, very fast. Thank you, Marcin, for for having uh, so so wide a range of of examples and simple things because I think a lot of times um, what you want to bring across is. Um, is hard to understand if you don't really know what you're talking about. So it was great that you had all those examples, pictures, etc. So thank you again. Also, congratulations at this point. I saw yesterday on LinkedIn that you got another award. So uh, well done you and your partner there. Um, at the moment, you see on your screen uh, the feedback form. So if you please fill that out. Uh, if you're done with that, just click it away. Um, and yeah, that brings us to a wrap. Uh, we have two minutes spare. Thank you very much again, Marcin, for, for everything. For anyone who has not been following in the chat, uh, the slides will be made available as PDF on online later that next week. And obviously you can rewatch all of this um, again on the YouTube channel of IOSH next week as well. Um, I'm part of both groups that actually were, were hosting this webinar the IOS offshore group and the East Anglia branch. And I think um, there was something here for everybody. I also saw that Angela, our branch chair in, in East Anglia also said, thank you very much for organizing all of this. Um, so yeah, thank you. It was great. And for everybody who, who doubted it for being Friday the 13th, that's a tick, we did it. No, no errors. <laughs> Fantastic. And thank you very much. Um... Ayosh for the opportunity to speak and thank you very much for the questions um, that that were asked. I hope it was of uh, of some use uh, and I look forward to uh, to um, working together in the future. Thank you. Perfect. Have a nice day everyone. Bye bye.